Welcome to Ear Biscuits, the podcast where two lifelong friends talk about life for a long time. I'm Link. And I'm Rhett. This week at the round table of dim lighting, we're going to be hearing from my friend here, the Linkster, Mm -hmm. uh, who's going to give us what I understand is a brief update. Yes. I mean, it's going to be. what you told me. Earth shattering yet succinct Uh, when it comes to. My spiritual, spiritual situation. My spiritual situation. And uh, uh-huh. we are also, because Link informed me that that was going to be rather brief, we are also going to be answering some of the questions that you responded to our prompt with when we asked you if you had any questions about our deconstruction. So we got some voicemails, we got some some um, excretions. Pointed questions we um, that we are going to answer as honestly as possible. Of course, this is coming on the heels of last week's episode where Rhett gave his uh, four-year anniversary update of, uh, you know, what you're worshiping these days. For me... Careful. Um, you know, I, I thought back on my update a year ago, and I realized that's kind of my update now. Okay. If you want to know what, where I'm at spiritually, uh, I'm still worshiping my dogs. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm not worshiping my dogs, but, um, you know, just a very s- simplified approach to um, uh, embracing love, receiving love, giving love, cultivating gratitude— um, remaining curious, remaining grateful, and it's working for me. You know, I think that your impulse, as demonstrated last week, as we talked about, is you you have such a fascination and an interest with the specifics of uh, belief, belief systems, faith, how different perspectives and philosophies impact your own thinking, and you're a research-oriented person, always, ha- always have, always will be. I, that's not really how I'm wired. I really enjoy the conversations and the connection around those things, and like I enjoyed hearing your update last week. I think the main reason for me was the connection aspect of it. I, uh, that's what drives a lot more my motivation is, I think, experience and also connection with people and also connection with myself. So I think there's still a lot of buttons that are, that are, that are pushed in me when I start to start to talk about churchy things or, you know, my experience in the evangelical church, uh, being a Christian, you know, all of that to me is like, it doesn't, um, it doesn't invigorate me. Mm-hmm. It kind of does a bit of the opposite. It's, it's, I'm doing, I've been doing work to like, I picture this, my brain is a plate. <laughs> a flat a plate. flat <laughs> plate, and it's like I just want it to be as dumb as this sounds. I want it to be empty of the burden of certain types of thoughts, like the way that I interact with. I'll just say churchy stuff, you know. When it um, when it comes to belief, it just it it tends to engage the part of me that like makes me less happy more uneasy, and um, because it's getting me reacquainted with, like, practices that I'm shedding that, that, as I've spoken about a lot, have to do with, like, shame and Mm -hmm. and guilt, Mm -hmm. and I'm still doing work, and still finding places where it's like, oh, yeah, that's, that's kind of a lingering dynamic at play here for me, and... So my exercise is, is shedding it and not, I just don't have a lot of interest, you know? 
it's not that I don't have beliefs, and I do think that some of this will come out in the questions that we have, but like, you know, it's just not, it's not my bag of chips anymore. Mm-hmm. What if when it when it's separated from um I think when it comes to you and I, the thing that engages me is the connection part of it and and being able to discuss it. So it's like this is not a chore. Last week was not a chore. Um but now I think when we talk about these things and it's more of I think we're both recognizing that it's a fascination on your part and there's certain ways that I can talk about it, especially with you, that I can get a kick out of where we come from Mm -hmm. versus, you know, I wouldn't, I'm, I would not sign up for some sort of, uh, gathering some, some gathering of like philosophy or especially like Christian debate. It's like, I just don't, I just don't really care Mm -hmm. for that. I don't care for it. Do you see a distinction? um, Because I I mean, I totally get like lack of interest in like, quote, churchy things. Maybe this will come out and as you talk about some of the, as you answer some of these questions, in terms of spirituality in a broad sense, outside of any sort of, uh, you know, structured way of thinking about it or using any, like, God terminology. or Yeah. I think for me, it's like, I, <clears throat> I think what I've characterized in the past as an openness is is still there. But I think it's more of a novel curiosity than a um like a motivated like really engaged questions on my brain that like I've I'm I'm interested in potential answers to questions. Like I'm just I'm more at a I'm not really in that place. Well, I guess what I'm asking so is it's, because I think uh, my suspicion is that we represent two, not ends of a spectrum, but like there's a lot of people who identify with your experience and your disposition, right? And yeah. so, so the thing, the thing that I uh, am curious about is for those people who are like, yeah, I like when Rhett starts talking about these detailed things. I tune out, I don't listen, which I totally get. Like I realize there's a, it's a niche for certain people. If, but what is spiritual growth for somebody like that? And so, I, I mean, I think, that's, I think that's my question for you because, well, that's, that's my question with no, nothing added. Yeah, I, th- I think first of all, there's still like, like I wanna read into the question and it's like, well, I had, I, I believe that I had a sense of what the what the answer that I would have wanted to give in the past was like well if you're if I don't say that spiritual growth is an is an active like value of mine if I start saying things that make it seem like it's not then does that make me seem like someone who's not thoughtful or someone who is not introspective or someone who's not, um, it, and so I, I kind of get caught up in that when I give my answer. But I think my honest answer is like the academic side of belief is just not something that I'm interested in. But there are other aspects of it, like the, experiencing the unknown, being open to the fact that there might be a higher power or something that we don't understand, like dimensions beyond us. I mean, say it as wild as you want or like say that it's God. I don't, you know, to me it's like that is fascinating, but in my heart of hearts, I just kind of think it's most likely just going to be conjecture and it kind of – 
it a lot of times it's reduced to just like an academic conjecture, and that just that just doesn't resonate well with, with me. So yeah, that, the, the thing that I do like my spiritual practice, I guess if you were to call it that, I don't think of it that way, but I am like. I'm I'm still engaged in being the the best version of myself being and like when I reduce things to like the love component of it all it's like when things are simple for me and that's what I described all in the last a year ago right it it put me in a good place to say okay this is what growth is for me it's it's um it's Finding my place in the world, finding my place in relationships, finding my finding my place within myself and being secure that spoiler alert, if this is it and there's nothing else, that I'm good with it. Mm-hmm. And I think we'll get into some of that stuff when we're answering some of the questions, but does that answer your question? Yeah, I think it kind does. Uh, I what I guess what I'm because I know that you are a thoughtful person who cares about your own personal growth. When you talk about spiritual things, I hear a distinction being made like spirit, like spiritual things are things about like supernatural things that you can't know anything about or academic conversation about those things. Yeah. And, uh, I guess where what I'm saying is that, as and I think it'll come out in some of these questions, like I'm interested in those academic discussions about those things, but that's actually not spirituality for me. Oh, yeah. And also like conjecture about the unknown or like thinking about the mystery of the universe or the mystery of God, that's spiritual in nature, but it's so impractical. I can't experience that in a way that I can communicate with with you or anybody about so but so then spirituality for you if i understand what you talked about last week was still a an active pursuit where you're you're taking steps forward um towards ideas so i yeah i this is actually i'm, I'm glad we're talking about this because i think that my i think that my update was much was much more about like how I'm thinking about that world because that was so much of my process of come. I thought my way out of it in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And I still have like a way that I'm organizing my thoughts about that, but there's still this um, heart that remains that is hungry for a spiritual experience and I think is having a spiritual experience. I didn't actually get into too many of the details about like what does my spiritual life look like now? It was more like here's the update of how I'm thinking about these things, some people who've been very influential in helping me understand where I'm at and then responding to that specific being featured in the book. Yeah. Okay. Because if I started talking about my spiritual experience, A, it's much harder to talk about because it's harder to describe, and B, it would have been a two-hour thing. Well, let, let's go there for a little bit because for me, I I would say that right now, I'm doing a whole lot of work on myself, right? You know, it's like when I'm in therapy every week, there's a, there's a lot of ex, like exploring and understanding and adjusting you know, uh, and there's there's a lot of. I think that is, it's a metaphysical practice. It's a <laughs> there's a spiritual component to it. I think. Now, when it comes to God, I feel like if they they know where to find me, you know, I'm not going out and looking for them or her or him or whatever. You know, I. I just I don't find myself doing it, and I th- I've I think that I've just given myself permission to say, yeah, it's like um, I am I'm open and I'm not horribly selfish, right? So it's like I I think that I'm I'm ready enough 
if God wants to, yeah. uh, if you know, God knows where to find me. And uh, but I'm not, I'm not going out searching and looking under a bunch of metaphysical yeah. rocks for that. Case in point, prayer. Like, you know, when we were going to Joshua Tree with some, uh, with uh, my scooter club friends, we were, t- we were like looking at the weather and we were joking about the weather. And I was like, you know what? Maybe we should all, we were all hanging out, like planning what we were going to do before, like a week before we went. And I was like, maybe we should all pray. And I didn't get struck by lightning. It was a joke, right? But I just, it was an experiment for me to say, like, I I was just curious how they would respond. Because I'm like, that's how I would have, that's what I would have done, right? That's what we did for the, you know, our entire adolescence growing up. It's like, you care about anything, you pray about it. It's like, what if I pray that God will give us, like, a wonderful stargazing experience? And then it became this running joke when it was raining cats and dogs that like- You should have prayed. Oh, well, uh, I did do a little prayer. Yeah, but you did it in mockery of God. It, it and so was, God gave you rain. I wasn't mocking, well, maybe I was. Maybe I was. But then, you know what? We had the most beautiful- uh, Calm after the storm. Moonrise came out. And then I was like, is this the moment that I changed my mind? And it wasn't. Maybe. It wasn't. Yeah. I'm just like, I'm sorry, I just have a sense of humor about well, all of it. But no, you no, know, no, it's no, like, no, that's great. I can't bring myself to pray sincerely. I well, just can't. No, no, that, that, I think the thing that I'm getting, so the thing that I'm getting do you, at, is that your spiritual practice is really all I was asking. Do I pray? Yeah, Do you have you uh, given it a shot? I, I've probably prayed 10 times in the past, you know, five years. Was it out of anguish? No. Was it out of any curiosity? It's just, you know, uh, when you were a Christian and you spoke to God a lot in the past, like I did, uh, you start, once you're no longer a Christian and you don't know what you think about those things and you don't know what you think about God, um, you often realize that the tenor of the conversation with God is very much like people who just talk to themselves. Like if I just, I'm talking to myself and working through something, it was kind of like I was doing that when I was praying in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, and so there have been a couple of times when I realized I'm kind of just having a conversation with myself, but what would it feel like if I were to kind of turn this as if I'm speaking to God about this thing and I've done that without reservation? Okay. Um, but the, you told me that Huberman was praying now. He's been praying. He just started talking about he it. He just started talking about praying. It's like, okay, so now you got this guy. Yeah, Christianity's this, back, man. This Mr. Heard? This Mr. Science guy, <laughs> take my advice, listen to my podcast. By the way, just as a like quick tangent, I can't listen to any of those podcasts for the same reason that I don't like to talk about churchy stuff. It's that brain plate thing that like the way that I engage with information that's like, okay, you well, you this is the truth about this, and this is how you should take action on it. There's so much of that on podcasts, on the internet, that like, I have, it's like I'm allergic to it. And well, I know that makes me sound stupid, but it's just not, It I don't have a positive internal relationship with, I think it's like authority and answers, especially when it's like, when there's a lot more questions than are being presented. I get that. I totally so get I don't that. listen to him, but apparently he's praying now. Yeah, or has been but talking about. I, it. So I think the thing again. I'm trying to. Uh, the reason I'm asking these questions is because I'm trying to benefit the person out there who relates to the way that you're talking about it, right? I, because I, I, I hope what's happening is that somebody's like, yeah, I don't, I don't see the big deal about it either. It's just like some people major in religion and some people major in. Engineering, but and some people are yeah, policemen. But let me just let me just get this thought. And out we're there. And, but we're all spiritual because I don't. What does that mean? What I don't want to happen, like what I don't want for you is I don't want the fact that you had a negative experience with religion, with Christianity, whatever you want to call it. Like your former faith doesn't get to dictate your spiritual experience now. And so if you if you want to have an experience of God or of just self growth and you you want to put it in spiritual terms like 
you shouldn't feel like I'm not allowed to do that because somebody said that it means this thing. Yeah. And I, so uh, I, cause I think that happens with a lot of people. They're like, cause I know the kind of person that you are and I know the kind of things that you're interested in. And I think at the end of the day, while I might be out here thinking about something in some like academic sense, that's actually not my spiritual, that's not my spiritual experience and that's not my spiritual viewpoint. We'll get into some of that with answering these questions. That I what think do you think mine is then? Because um, I do it. I mean, there's, and again, it's like a lot of what I said last time when I'm like using my dogs as a yeah as an inspiration point for no, yeah I, it, for being that was your that was your spiritual update at the last time and what I'm saying is that's it's valid because the thing that religions do is they box in and systematize the thought process around something that if there is any spiritual truth that exists, the moment that you begin talking about it, the moment that you begin writing about it, with every word, you are one step further away from whatever truth existed. So when you, so, so, so the Bible itself, whatever truth the Bible is trying to capture with every word that was written is one step further away from whatever truth. Whatever yeah. Jesus actually said, when somebody started thinking about it and writing it down, they were, with every word, they were one step further away from them whatever he actually did say. Okay. And so what I'm trying to communicate to you and to anyone who thinks like you is that these things are not off limits to you because- I, I, don't, I don't believe that they are. Right. But, and, I, and I don't want to- mischaracterize yeah my spiritual practice is being as present as possible and so i guess i'm an like i'm a i'm a backdoor buddhist right you know kind of it's just i think if i'm as present as possible and as in touch with my heart which i trust that there's there's some goodness deep the, the deeper i go the more good there is and like the more that i'm in in touch with that and present in this current reality that I'm living moment to moment, and it's really hard to do, then I will be ready for whenever they show up in a new way that I didn't expect. That's my spiritual practice. Yeah, I like that. You wanna do an ad? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. But, um, if you want to join the Mythical Society and get any of the previous uh, quarterly collectible items, it's like records, comic books, blankets, hoodies, um, figurines, any of that exclusive collectible stuff from the past few years, now's your time to join um, the third degree annual plan. You can also get it as a gift card and activate it at any time you want. Um, you will then be able to choose one of those items while supplies last through February 29th. So now's your chance. Get it. Mythicalsociety.com. Ear Biscuits is supported by Butcher Box. I recently got a big old box of meat from Butcher Box and I have already gotten into it. Uh, I had, there was two ribeyes in there and I took those things and I've just become an expert, Link. I'm just gonna be, I'm just gonna be honest with you. I've become an expert at cooking a steak in a cast iron skillet. Okay. And doing a little braising butter with some garlic and some rosemary at the end and then slicing it and serving it to my family. They love it. And then yesterday I took two of the racks of Kiribata pork ribs, oh. St. Louis style ribs, and I made raspberry chipotle barbecue ribs wow. on the smoker. Now they come frozen. To the delight of everyone. It sounds like that that wasn't a hitch at all to like. Oh no, 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 you just take it. Yeah. You just take it out of the, the freezer and let it thaw in the fridge or how, whatever your preferred method of thawing is and it was like, no one would have. I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it was incredible. Uh, I also got some butcher box and I, I grilled the uh, chicken wings. Oh. That's the first thing I did. Yep. You got in your box too. That was great. And the meat is, uh, just the highest quality, 100% grass-fed beef, free-range organic chicken, pork raised, crate-free, and wild-caught seafood. It's especially helpful because it means you don't have to go to the store to get your meat, and your freezer is always full of meat just in case you end up needing a fast dinner to whip up. Yeah, I like that each box has curated tips and recipes that are specific to what you ordered as well. Meat prices are going up and up, so it's kind of a no-brainer, plus, ButcherBox gives you free extras for a whole year? Yes. 
Eat better this year with the best meat and seafood on the planet delivered to your door. ButcherBox is offering you their choice of a weeknight meal essential, three pounds of chicken thighs, two pounds of ground beef, or one pound of premium steak tips for free in every order for a whole year. Plus, get $20 off your first order. Sign up today at butcherbox.com slash ear and use code ear to choose your free offer and get $20 off. All right, let's start with the first question. Uh, I'm still calling these tweets, uh, you know. Um, yeah. Excretions is what I want to call them. Um, Mako asked, did you ever even for a second consider a different religion than Christianity or do you simply just believe that all of them are wrong? Did I ever for a second? Um, I'll give my answer because it's quicker. I think it at this point I don't because of... I mean, I think it's obvious what, based on what I've just been saying, but like, I, I just have this, I just have this strong inkling that, yeah, we're, we're all just trying to figure it out. And it's, and it's, uh, if it was easy to, if, if the answers were there, I think we'd have, they would be more evident by this point in human history. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna lean back a little bit. Right. I mean, in this question, it's funny. There's there's um, there's only a few uh, evangelical religions, and when I say that, I mean religions that that, that proselytize, religions that want to talk you into their situation. Jehovah's Witness. Uh, well, you've got Christians, and you've got all the offshoots of Christians, and then you've got the, you know, where, when we get into Jehovah's Witnesses and uh, Mormons, you know, if we, from an evangelical perspective, where they don't think that they're Christians or whatever, but it's kind of based on Christianity, right? So uh, th there's lots of proselytizing that happens in, in, in that group. So in terms of like, did I consider like another offshoot of Christianity? It's like, well, no, because they're all kind of based on the same thing. But lots of questions come in from uh, Muslims. You know, did you consider Islam? You know, they, you know, they believe uh, that the Quran is the word of God, and there's a you know it's a it's a different system. It's an Abrahamic religion, but it you know it's based on like this revealed revelation that's in the Quran, and um, I have not like studied it terribly deeply, but I know enough about it to know that they make what I feel is the same ultimate mistake that proselytizing religions make, which is an exclusive claim to our telescope to use the, yep. you know, we've got the right telescope. We've got the right picture of God. And so that whole mentality was something that was never attractive. Mm -hmm. uh, and also I'm like, okay, I can sort of do the thought exercise of what it would be like to go into a deep dive on the apologetics from a Muslim perspective. And I can imagine that uh, the same types of debates happen. And I've seen some of them on the internet, the same types of debates about the historicity of things and the legitimacy of things and their view of Jesus and stuff like that. And it just gets into this headspace where you're like, guys, whatever spiritual truth there is, that you guys are just over, you're thinking about it and you're trying to say that you've got the exclusive view. And it's just like, that ain't, that ain't it. That ain't it, chief. What about Eastern religions? So Eastern religions are a different bag in my view. So you talked about Buddhism. I think that Eastern religions are, I think they're much more religious philosophies than they are religions, right? Yeah. So they are often a way of being, a way of doing life that gets very, very practical. And that's why they've been so easily adopted by so many Westerners who aren't religious. I mean, you got somebody like Sam Harris, who is one of the four horsemen of the eighth, you know, the new atheism. And, He's a huge proponent of um, Buddhism and meditation from a completely practical atheistic standpoint, just to prove the point that this, we're talking about things that, yeah, there's some sort of metaphysical, when you get down into it, there's this metaphysical understanding that is probably where you get real shaky and you can't really support it scientifically. But the impacts of meditation, um, you know, mindfulness, and those, it's just, we know that those things work. In the same way that we know that praying within the context of Christianity, we're not saying it works, but it works for the person who's doing the praying in terms of there is something, people who are religious, people who have faith are on, you know, 
on the whole happier. <laughs> right. When but, you're not right. sending people to hell, it, it, the, anything on that under that category becomes l more appealing. <laughs> right. But I'm just saying that. So uh, there's lots of one of the things is that when you're in the Christian camp or when you're in the conservative evangelical Christian camp, if you get you want to you know behind closed doors, the thing that they will say is that all these other religions are essentially different versions of Satanism. Right. I mean, that's what we were taught. Buddhism is is any anything that distracts from Li the well, gospel. Well, lies, yeah, lies. And so, who's the who's the author of Buddhism? Buddha? No, Satan. <laughs> if you want to get down to it, but when you realize that we're all just setting up our tent, putting our telescope towards the sun, trying to figure out what the hell's going on, then you start saying, "Well, what's working for people?" If if this is not some definitive game of like exclusive truth but we're just trying to kind of brush up against some kind of reality that might be significant and might impact us. I think the practical, we, we, now it kind of opens you up to like, well, what are we, what, what do these guys have to say? And like lots of these Buddhist principles that have come through mindfulness, reading about mindfulness and meditation are like super significant and a huge part of my spiritual practice. And then you got people like Eckhart Tolle who are able to synthesize Christianity and Buddhism into something where it's just like, can talk about things in a really insightful and helpful spiritual way. Does he make some claims about spiritual reality that I don't think you can back up? Well, of course, but is it useful? Is it meaningful? Does it improve my life and the lives of the people around me? Yeah, so I would say that no, I'm not gonna consider an exclusive religion, but is there wisdom within these different traditions that we all can benefit from? Well, of course, that's why they've stuck around for so long. Uh, bored guy, at always bored Bob, how do you overcome the feeling that you just might be wrong? I'm going through my own questioning faith journey, but the fear I have of being wrong and then spending eternity in hell keeps me from fully deconstructing. I even feel my thoughts about leaving faith are immoral. I totally relate to this. Um, you know, being on the inside it was I, I I gained so much benefit from the perceived security of um, you know eternal life and es 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 escaping the the uh, the punishment of hell and does it keep you up at night now? Not at all. And why? Uh, I don't I don't because I just don't I I just don't believe that you that you've got to be right about something to get into heaven. It's like, it, it just doesn't, it, it just doesn't, that doesn't say justice to me. That doesn't say uh, creator to me. It doesn't speak, um, that doesn't speak to me. Well, the holy God has to judge sin. He can't be in the presence of sin, Link. And so who's gonna pay for your sin? What are you gonna do with your sin? Um, I I just don't I just don't buy it. Um, but I but but I did at one point and that had to change. Yeah, I do not lose any sleep over a fear of hell, and I would say one of the reasons is for the same reason that when I was a Christian I didn't lose any sleep over fear of the Muslim hell, and none of the Christians that I knew or know now, lose any sleep over being infidels and maybe going to Muslim hell. And why? Because they don't believe in it. <laughs> yeah. So it's just as simple as that. Why do you not fear hell? Because I don't believe in it. Right. I don't think that it's actually a thing. Now, but you might say, but you used to. Isn't that different if you used to? And then, yeah, yes, you're right. If you used to really hardcore believe that that was true, isn't that lodged somewhere in your brain? Yes, to a degree. So how have, what has been helpful for me? I think one, the main thing that's been helpful for me is that learning about the, uh, the origin of the idea of hell, right? So when it's just this thing that you're just like, I was a Christian and I believed in hell, but like, again, one of the benefits uh, for me personally, of like continuing to look into all this stuff and study all of it, um, is that there, you know, 
again, I, I, with every time I take a deeper step into this thing, again, I get more evidence that this whole Christian thing in the Bible is just this uh, very incredible, beautiful in ways, elaborate invention of people over a long period of time, right? That's changing and shifting. And there are different aspects of the philosophy that have evolved. And hell is like example number one of something that is wildly inconsistent over the course of the development of the religion. If you go back to, if you're, ta- if you're talking about the way that the people who wrote the Old Testament thought about hell, it was like, well, they didn't think about hell. It wasn't even a thing. There was Sheol and there was a place that people went and it was just a, it was kind of just an empty place that people went. It's on my arm now in my tattoo. Um, but it wasn't hell. It was an eternal conscious torment. And then you've got the way that hell is depicted in the New Testament, which is, uh, again, it's not, there is, the idea that we have of hell is a product of the time and the place in which the church, early church fathers were processing the history of thought about this concept, heavily influenced by all the philosophy that was in their minds based on where they lived and at the time and place they lived. And so this idea that we have of hell in the way that you would see it described in like a systematic theology book, it's not, it's drawn out of certain biblical passages, but it's, if you just take a step back and look at it in an honest and truthful way, you're like, this is not some clear concept presented in some authoritative word of God. This is an invention of people. And when you have a fear of hell, it is having its intended effect. It's the reason that it's a part of the philosophy is that it's, in, it's genius. It's incredibly effective at keeping you in the fold. It's incredibly effective at keeping you in a state of fear of what will happen if you leave. So, you know, it's like if you are in a relationship with somebody and you are running up against, you know, there's something about the, your interaction with them that's kind of like ripping you apart on the inside. And then somebody, a third party, can look at your relationship relationship and be like, you're being manipulated by this person. And you see it from what it is for be, as manipulation. It changes the dynamic and it changes the way that you think about that person. So when you understand hell as a manipulative tool inside of this ideology, all of a sudden it loses a little bit of its power. You can see through it, right? So you see the human invention that it is. Yes, there's lots of like moral problems with it when you think about it from just this concept of God, like you were getting at and creator and that kind of thing. But you don't even have to get there. You don't even have to go to a, phil- a philosophical evaluation of it. On its face, we can see that it was invented by people and it is a tactic to keep you scared and keep you in. And so me just looking at it and being able to recognize that, all of a sudden it's like looking at something that seems really solid and really clear and it just sort of fades away. And so, no, I don't think about it at all. And, but I understand that a lot of people do and that it's, it's, it's having its intended effect. It's keeping a lot of people in and it's also just burdening a lot of people who've left because it's real, real effective. It's a, it's effective piece of propaganda. Very, very effective. Well, this is kind of like a good follow-up question. Fleetwood Zach, I like that. What are y'all's thoughts on the afterlife It's hard for me to believe there isn't anything after this. Also, it would make me hella depressed to know nothing happens after this life. Um, I'm not, well, I'm not, I don't, I'm not afraid of dying because I just know that I'm going to. So, I, I, you know, it's, it really makes sense to me to just get, get over it. You know, it's, um, and I've had enough relatives die in a way that's heart-wrenching, ugly, you know, that it's like, well, I gotta, I've gotta be ready for that to happen to me. I've also had people close to me die just like freak accidents, you know, and so it's, uh, I'm afraid of not dying but needing to die. Like, <laughs> I see a lot of that. Huh. And that's, that's, yeah, that's bad. That is bad. Whether you're laid up in a hospital for years or, you know, it's like, that's what I'm afraid of. 
like torture on this side. But like, I mean, you go to sleep and then you wake up the next day and you're like, damn, it's like time travel. You know, it's like, what if you go to sleep and you never wake up? It's like, ultimately, if that's all that it is, you know, you get the, you get the IV drip for your colonoscopy and you don't remember a damn thing. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, well, um, that could be what it's like to cease to exist. And it, you know, once you're there, it doesn't really hurt because it's not you anymore. It's just, you know. Um, you won't care. And then if there's something you won't on the- care about anything. You know, it's like, I talk about hope. It's like, do I hope that I'm pleasantly surprised that there's something on the other side of it that's like amazing or, or different? and potentially rewarding in some way? No. <laughs> what? I'm in a mood today, man. I don't know. It's, I'm, because if I die and I don't exist, I can't hope at that point. It's just like, well, that's it. You know, it's like, that's it. So it's, I, I just gotta focus on what I got, what I know I have, and that's this. And by the way, you know, I'm in an extremely privileged position to, uh, in so many ways you can look at it, and I'm extremely grateful, and it makes it very easy for me to say these things. And so I'm sorry if I'm like, if I'm kind of flaunting the fact that like I've you got it. You so don't good. even want to be pleasantly surprised. I no, but I, I I guess what I was I I'm very intrigued, but I'm not like oh my god I I need to know that there's something better on the other side. I don't need to know that, right. you know. I've got it good enough that I can just die. Right. It's just the it's just the you know. I'm extremely <laughs> grateful for that. I don't understand, and no one understands yet the nature of consciousness. Right. It's I mean. I've been reading a lot about it lately, and it's mind blowing just to consider it. Um, I think that the idea, the idea that this conscious being right here, right, which is regardless of the nature of consciousness, an element of my experience is has some sort of physical basis, like the way, like. The way that my eyes focus on you is based on the physiology of my eyes, right? The way that your eyes see something is based on the physiology of your eyes, your specific eyes. My brain is a conduit by which I experience consciousness, regardless of the nature of consciousness. So that's why if I hit you in the head with a hammer, you become a different person, right? Did I hit your spirit? No, I hit your brain. And your brain is the physical thing by which you're experiencing consciousness. So when you die and the brain shrivels up, your experience, I would say there is a 0% chance that your conscious experience is just a continuous, uninterrupted thing because you're losing the thing by which you experience your experience. Right. So is it gonna be like, going into surgery and waking up, almost 100% no, how could it be? However, we don't, there's a lot that we don't know about consciousness. And the idea that there is some sort of continuation of whatever it is that is the conscious part of you or some sort of returning of whatever you are in the part of you that isn't physical to some greater reality, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the case, but I've always wanted the idea, I love the idea of an afterlife, and one of the things I used to sit around in my bed and think about about heaven is just like how big the universe was and how like I wanted to f fly all over it and like see all these amazing gas balls and asteroids and other planets, and I was, I, I was convinced that the reason that God had created this incredible universe was so that we could go experience it all after death. It's like, What's the point of all this? It's called, he's going to give us the power to go around and be uh, super people. Uh, which, incidentally, there's a little bit of that in Mormonism, which is, makes, makes it kind of cool. Um, but uh, all that to say, I want there to be something. But if there's not, I won't care because I won't 
anything. Yeah. I won't fill in the blank. I won't be. So right. why am I going to sit around and worry about it? I'm not worried about it. And I'm not, you know, I understand being, quote, hella depressed <laughs> to know nothing happens after this life. But it's kind of like, why worry about tomorrow? Tomorrow has enough worries, or tomorrow will worry today, about itself. Today has enough worries. You know, worries. as Jesus said. So it's just like, don't worry about it. Don't be hella depressed about it. It might be awesome. It might be nothing. It might be eternal conscious torment. And I'm going to get it real bad because of all the things I've said on the internet. Um, but boy, I think that that's really, 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 really unlikely. So it's the same reason I still take flights. Yeah, I could crash in a, in a plane, but I got to get to San Diego. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I'm still could, getting on that plane. Damn, you could take a train down there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's play a voicemail. Hey, Rhett and Link. I was just wondering if you guys could share how you have dealt with, um, if applicable, any feelings of isolation or being an outsider to the community that you previously grew up in. Um, I personally left Mormonism many years ago, but as a consequence, wasn't able to attend either one of my sister's weddings inside the temple. Um, and that was hard. So I was wondering if you had any similar experiences or of those sort of feelings and how you dealt with it. Thanks for sharing. Really appreciate you guys sharing your stories. Hmm. Thank you for sharing yours. I'm sorry that you couldn't be there for your sister's wedding. That sucks. That sucks. You know, we we are, uh, based on all the people that I've known and the stories like yours that I've heard, we, I'll speak for myself, but I think I'll speak for both of us. Yeah. We're really lucky in this regard, right? Um, we've had each other. We've had our wives. We've made new friends. We've built new community. We moved. To- we moved at a really strategic time in this process. And we have remained not necessarily part of the same community, but we have also remained friends with people who are still, you know, in the faith. And, um, but I think that this, like, this sense of isolation, I, to me, I think that, I think this is the, this is the big one. I think that the idea, um, of being outside of this community that, again, one of the reasons that it works, if you, I mean, we're kind of in the middle of a social experiment just as a species, right? For the vast majority of human history, you were kind of, you were born and like, this is, you were handed down. This is what you believe about the world. This is what you do. This is where we live. It was all kind of given to you. And we're like the first point in human history where everybody on a very large scale is sort of like kind of left to figure it out on their own in some sense. And, but these communities still exist. And so you lead these communities. This is not, this is hard. This is really hard stuff that's happening culturally right now. If you're, especially when you talk about some of these communities like the Mormon community, where it's like that community is so intact and going as far as you can't even come in the temple for the ceremony anymore. You know, in evangelical circles, like, they may not be happy that you're at the Christmas Eve service, but they ain't going to tell you to leave. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Now, we're also privileged in the fact that our families, while we disagree, we still love each other. We we still have meaningful relationships. So we haven't been shunned in a way that a lot of people have been shunned. And so... um, I don't know. I'm I, I could, I'm just saying I'm sorry. This is a very difficult thing. I'm not going to underestimate how difficult it is if you feel that isolation and you're being kind of sh- shunned. It, it's uh, it sucks. If I hadn't moved to Los Angeles when when we did at that point in our careers, I think I would either still in it. I think I would have had to have moved like the community that I was in and we're still in touch with like people that care about us deeply that are like you know very involved in the church yeah including the pastor of the church that we went to mm-hmm. um uh so I, it, nothing against 
nothing against them specifically, but when you're like, when it's a small community, it's a smaller town, and then you've got this like close knit church community, and then you're like, okay, I'm struggling and I'm slowly moving to that out of it, you know? I think that I would have just, I think I would have had to have moved to uh, another town. You know, I would have had to had some sort of a a clean break and said, you know what, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta build a new community for myself. That's not just like I'm the outsider in the community that I was a part of. I just either that or I would have, I would have stayed in it and just been mildly miserable due to internal uh, turmoil of consciousness. I know a lot of people have done that. A lot of people, conscience. Have, a lot of people, <laughs> not consciousness. <laughs> a lot of people that I know have stayed in. Uh, don't believe, but have stayed in because of the power of the community and the relationships that they have there. And I don't blame them. Right. I, you know, I could, I, I could see myself. You kind of have that. to make the best decision for yourself. I think you have to make the best decision given the circumstances that you are in. Um, and I think that it's like, what is the least personally damaging path? Right? Yeah. Uh, and I'm not going to be, because we can't prescribe your situation. We don't know w- what you're going through. You were a close friend and, you know, it would be different, but it's, I don't know what you're dealing with, but I just don't think anyone should feel pressure any way, you know? Yeah. You have to make the decision that's 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 best for you and the people in your life. And some people are going to be like, I'm just going to kind of stick around in this community. I don't believe, and I'm going to like kind of wait for my my foot out the door, but I'm not going until I got somebody to go with or until I make, I, I realized that there's some community that I could be a part of. Mm-hmm. Um, let's, so, you, you know, you know yourself better than anybody. Let's hear this related voicemail. Hi. So I'm kind of going through my own little deconstruction era at the moment. And I think the biggest question, because I don't have anyone else to talk to about this is, do you still have a relationship with the people who are still Christian even after you deconstruct it? Because I think that is the biggest hurdle that I'm kind of going through right now. Like I've been going through this alone because I don't want to lose any of the relationships that I have. And so I just kind of want to see if you guys still have relationships with the people who are in the church right now. Also, I love your biscuits and I love Good Mythical Morning. Thank you for choosing my comment. Goodbye. So we were kind of talking about this a little bit, but I think there is a different aspect of this, um, and that is the what is it like to be in relationship with people that are still Christians, and like how do you manage that? Um, and I think the answer is boundaries, because what happens a lot of times is that if you leave a Christian community, you become the black sheep, you become the project, right? You you now are the per, someone's personal project. They gotta bring you back in the fold. And I think that you just have to communicate. Now, first of all, we've been blessed with Christian friends who are uh, whatever enough, tactful, loving, smart, whatever the word is you wanna give, to not, even if they feel strongly that they want us back in the fold, they do not base our relationship on that. The relationship is based on connection. And I'm, that's a privilege, and I appreciate that from those people. Yeah, the word I would use specifically related to our like college boys friend group yeah. um, is empathy. You know, there's a genuine love and an, and an understanding of, of our ex- experience. And they they empathize and they filter, you know, how that how it's changed our relationship some, but not in every way, and yeah. not in what, you know, we all might would have thought. Wow, is this is this a core change? Mm-hmm. And then it's it's been nice to know that it's it's actually it has not been right. But if but if I had a friend, thankfully I don't. If I had a friend who I knew that the purpose of their continued friendship with me was primarily to get me back in the group. Yeah. 
and also that was the nature of our conversation and our interaction on a regular basis, I would just set the boundary and I'd be like, hey man, I love you, I wanna be your friend, I'm not going to be your project. I'm not going to be your personal project. And if your only way of interacting with me is as your personal project, then I'm gonna have to say, we're gonna limit our interactions and you can pray for me all you want to, but I'm not gonna subject myself to that kind of relationship. Yeah. And I just think you have to set that boundary and I think there are people who will respect it. I, you know, there was, Chrissy and I reconnected over the past couple of years, you know, after, you know, being out here 15 years, we reconnected with like our, our pastor and from back home and family. Like when they came out here to visit um, family members that were out here, like we spent the day with them and like reconnected and it was great. And um, there, I think there was some, there was a healing component to that, mm -hmm. you know? Um, oh, yeah. Even though it was not ever explicitly discussed, you know, it's like we still care about you and you were, you, you meant so much to us and this conversation went both ways. That it's like it's just nice to to be in each other's lives again, and for those boundaries to be there. Well, we didn't ever have to talk about it. And then, you know, we were close with uh, the pastor, the church that we were involved in here, and we've remained connected. But there was like there was a period of time when there was more distance, mm -hmm. and it just took. I think there was like a time of processing and like, hey, I gotta. It's going to be simpler for me if if we don't see each other for a while. I just think it practically played out that way. Again, it wasn't a discussion. But then there was a point where we start to reconnect. Let's hang out. Let's catch up. Let's get lunch. Let's do, you know, and then it was, so now it's kind of rebuilding a friendship on the other side of deconstruction, but far enough on the other side of it. So, um you know that's been my experience. So there's 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 hope there, but it there, but there was a there were it was a good chunk of time, years where it was like all right, let's this this might not be as active as a friendship, you know. And I think again, this is just you know privilege again being in Los Angeles. Like this is a town that there is not a this isn't. This isn't Fuquay Verena, right? This is w w this is a incredibly diverse place in terms of people and in terms of thought. So while there are a lot of very evangelical Christians here, they exist in a world in which right is you know if you're in certain towns in the South, it's just like you sit down and go go out to get coffee with somebody. It's just like where do you go to church? It's like you don't get that question out here. Um, right, I don't. It's not know. culturally Christian. Do people still bow their heads and pray in public back in North Carolina? Oh, I assume so. Yeah. L last time I was, I mean, like that doesn't happen out here. Last time I was home. If you're devout, you you don't you don't you don't put it out. Last time I was home, I saw <laughs> literally there literally that was at a restaurant, and I saw <laughs> I counted six tables, six tables. Over the course of my one meal in which people were praying, I was like, this is, yeah, I forgot. I forget, this is what people do. And that's why, that's why it was like, it, it would have been so hard to still be there. And it's like, you know, you get, hey, let's get coffee. And then it's like, okay, now it's like, you're praying, we, we want to pray together over this coffee? And it's like, no, nah, we need to have an awkward coffee. Everything is now becomes a, a rub, you know, because yeah. there's so much that's culturally ingrained, you know? Yeah. Ashley, Ashley Brewer, longtime mythical beast, uh, asks a very good question. Where is your hope found, especially when things seem really, really bad? Okay. Well, that's, that's, this was one that I was really afraid of. You didn't want to answer this. Not, when I was coming to grips with the fact that, like, ah, I think I am moving out of the church. I think I... I think I'm about to say that I'm not a Christian anymore. It was like, that was one of the things that really scared me about saying it was like, oh man, when the shit hits the fan, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do if I'm like on a record? Like, if, and I, and if, if I tell that maybe God- It'll hit the fan and you'll have to come back with your tail between your legs. But, or I, I don't know where I'm gonna turn. Hmm. I don't know where I'm gonna turn. Um, or what I'm going to believe about it. Like, where am I gonna find hope? 
Um, but I'm going to let you answer first. Okay. <laughs> I'm just going to say that it, it, it did scare me. Um, this is a great question because outside of the community question, I think that this is the most important question for people because it's a brass tax. It's, it, it's where the rubber meets the road, man. It's like, where do you find your hope? Because mm -hmm. isn't that the point of all this to begin with? When you get that diagnosis, when you get that horrible phone call, when you are at the bottom of the barrel, when like you've been abandoned, yeah. when you don't have any direction in life, when you don't have any money, yeah. you know, it, the list goes on and on. These are common things that happen. Yeah, and so, and, and so odds are is going to happen in one form or another to every single person. It is the human existence. It feels like in one form or another to be a guarantee. So if you don't have an answer, Rhett, then aren't you, it's like you're setting yourself up for even more pain. You're screwed. That's how I felt about it. So I've got two, there's two aspects to my answer to this, and this is not your answer. This is my answer. So I'm not saying that this is what you should think. This is just what has been helpful to me. Um, the subtext of this question is, is uh, not from an, uh, an accusatory standpoint, but the subtext is, I'm assuming that you would have at one point said, your hope is in Jesus, your hope is in God. And now that you don't identify as a Christian, where's your hope found? So that's all things work together for the good of those who love Him and who are called according to His purpose. So one of God the, has a plan for you. Romans eight twenty eight. So one of the one of the things that was a really significant sort of part of my deconstruction, and this kind of happened slowly. So this is the first part of the answer, and this is kind of from a again. I always have the like. There's something happening on an intellectual level, and then there's something kind of ha happening on the heart level. So I'll kind of talk about both of those. From an intellectual standpoint, um, I came to the conclusion that it was difficult for me to explain the practical difference between believing in the sovereignty of God and believing in complete chaos and randomness. Let me explain that. So when the shit hits the fan, uh, what you say as a as a as a Christian traditionally is that you know God is at work, God is in control. He's not going to give me any more than I can take. The reality is is that you never know exactly what that is that God has in store for you because it could be that there's more shit that's going to hit the fan, right? It may be that the shit's going to hit the fan so hard that you're literally going to hit a fan and die. <laughs> like you don't know where the end of it is. And from, just from a completely practical standpoint, the difference in outcome between God being in control and there being no control at all, there's, you can't decipher between those two things. It's really just a mindset. Yeah. So I, that may not be convincing to you, but for me personally, it was kind of like, what is it to believe that God is in control? It's just to believe it, that what? He, he, he's the puppet master who is the one that got me into this automobile accident and then is the reason I had to get my leg amputated, but he did it for my good. And no, oh, now I gotta get my other leg amputated, but God is still doing it for good. But I'm still without legs at the end of this thing. And God is doing it for good, but, I, and then it's like, well, or I was in an accident, sometimes accidents happen and now I'm without legs, I'm still, in the same situation, just from we, a practical standpoint. We never believed that God was going to protect us from all harm. We actually believed that there was a higher purpose when those inevitable things happened. So it was, it, yeah, mindset. What? How do you respond emotionally, philosophically to the hardship, to the shit hitting the fan, uh, yeah. to the nightmare? Yeah, and that's where the, 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 I would say the heart concept. So there's a, you know, Ram Dass has a book called Grist for the Mill. I haven't read it, but I've heard him talk about the concept of Grist for the Mill in a number of talks that I've listened to, right? And of course, Grist for the Mill in a literal sense is this idea that you bring raw material to a mill, like you might bring, you know, whole wheat to a mill and you put it in a mill and it becomes flour. It grinds it down violently right and sort of the, the the philosophy of 
Every single thing that happens to you, no matter how good or no matter how bad, is grist for the mill. Every single thing that happens to you, no matter how good, no matter how bad, is the raw material by which you can be transformed into the future version of yourself, into the part, of, into the next you the, that you grow into. The, 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 you, the spiritual growth that takes place is based on how you process the raw material. And so I actually think that that's the exact same thing on just a practical level that I would have said about, well, God is doing this thing and God is in control and my hope is in the idea that God has a plan that on the other end of this, I will be whoever it is that God wants me to be. I will be in the place that God wants me to be. There's a slightly different semantic, you know, there's a semantic difference between just a general principle of the universe, regardless of the nature of the universe, whereby which, regardless of what's happening to me, I have the opportunity to see this as grist for the mill, as something that will turn me into, will transform me into the next version of myself. So I will be in the place that I'm supposed to be. And so I'll just be honest with you. Like, you know, I've experienced some difficult things. I've experienced things that I haven't talked about on this podcast. I don't share publicly that are difficult things for me to get to. Whereas when I get through, when I was a Christian, I would have been like, God, you're in control. I would have prayed and I would have been like, I'm trusting the outcome is in your hands and that you know what's best for me. What happens now is I'm like, shit happens. I live in a universe where shit happens and I don't know if it's a part of a greater plan or not. I tend to believe that there's some sort of intention to the universe, but I don't know. And that's not the thing that brings me comfort, but my only, what I have is I have the power of choice to be like, this thing is happening and it can be uh, for my growth or it can be for my destruction. And I'm kind of the only one who can make that decision. Um, and so it gives me a perspective in the midst of something that's really, really hard to be like, man, this is really, really hard, but this is what, this is what the universe has for me right now. And if I'm in the midst of feeling something that makes me, I feel so hopeless and I feel so helpless, that feeling of hopelessness and helplessness can be exactly what I need to get on the other side of the hopelessness. For whatever reason, it's not, and it's not some intellectual thing that I'm like thinking through, it's, it's, it is ultimately a mindset. So to me, believing that God is in control is a mindset that is very helpful for the vast majority of people on the planet still. And I think it's a very useful mindset. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have that mindset. If you've got that mindset, I'm not asking you to change. I'm just saying, I don't have that mindset anymore, but I essentially go through the same motions and end up at the same place from a slightly different perspective. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like that. I mean, it's it's a growth mindset. It's basically what you're saying. I think for me, it's like, I fully expect that, that there is impending doom in one form or another in my that's gonna that's gonna hit my life and uh i just when it happens i just have to say this is happening i have to accept it as happen yeah. happening my hope is that i will have the resources meaning like the relationships the the wherewithal the outer strength and maybe the inner strength to to move forward like you're saying, grow and not just curl up and die. Mm -hmm. But the answer may also, at some point, is going to be curl up and die. You're going to die. Right. So It's, it's going to get you eventually. Um, I think the thing that it does for me now, the way that I think about it is it, it makes me very grateful mm -hmm. in this moment, you know? Um, and, you know, when the moments, when it's tough to find the thing to be grateful for, when you're at your lowest, um, I, I can only I can just I can only hope I can only hope that uh, that I get through it. Yeah. Or I mean, it's like I don't know. It's it, the contrast makes me very grateful 
for the moments when in the times or the seasons when that's not happening. If you're the guy at the mill who takes in the new raw material and you're like, well, there is a truck full of shit today. Well, that's what, that's what you got today. You got a truck full of shit. What are you gonna do? Put it in the mill, put it in the mill. Oh, you got a truck full of gold today. Put it in the mill, <laughs> put it in the mill. And just know it's gonna, the truck shows up every day and it's a mixed bag. Put it in the mill. You got no choice. And then eventually one day the mill's gonna stop working and you're gonna die. <laughs> is, this, is this too dark, Jenna? You're all about darkness. <laughs> like, yeah, none of this I, looked, I looked at Jenna and I was like, I, I fully expected you to be chomping at the bit over there to say something. <laughs> You don't have to, but uh, yeah, I don't. I don't have much to say. But yeah, I, I've, I'm very much on the. If it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. Why worry? <laughs> I guess. Yeah, there's just kind of a stark reality to it. Mm -hmm. um, but I do like the growth mindset thing that Rose is talking about. It's like it, it. That is very similar to like what what I would put on God. That's what we already believed. It's what we already believed, and it's all things you know, work together for good. You find a way to, you for know, those who are called according to his, who love God and are called according to his purpose. Okay, I still kind of believe that. Um, um, <laughs> let's listen to a voicemail about family. Hi, Rhett and Link. My name is Randy, not of the cotton candy variety. Um, I am calling in regards to your tweet about questions vis-a-vis -vis your deconstruction. I was wondering how do you guys sort of facilitate those conversations with your family? I've also de deconstructed. My grandmother is a devout Southern Baptist, and every time I see her, she tells me that she's worried for my salvation, and I, I don't know how to... I don't know, make it stop. <laughs> uh, any advice or anything that you can provide would be really grateful. Thanks, love you guys. You can relate to this, can't you? I can definitely relate to this. Uh, yeah, and I've you know, talked about it in therapy and I, I heard a great song once about a guy who like went home for the holidays and his, his uh, worldview had changed. Oh. Hmm. <laughs> What's the name of that song? Heavy. Heavy. Yeah, why did you call it that? Because it could be heavy. It could be heavy. Yeah. Um, yeah, I really had to, especially with certain outspoken um, members, mem member of my family, <laughs> um, to say, you know what? I'm, uh, well, first of all, there's two things. There's like, how much do you share and how much pain are you? perceived pain are you signing your loved one up for by sharing? And there's like the the reticence to do that. And then the second part is once it does come out and the situation that the caller was in, it's like, all right, once it's out there and now you're on the receiving end of like, like what feels like piling on guilt and concern back on you, you know? I think that Finding a secure place within yourself, and I had to find a secure place within myself to say, okay, this is where I'm at for good reasons for me, and I don't have to translate all of that to somebody else. Like, when you love somebody, you want them to feel great about you, and you want them to know that you're happy and all of these things, but, like, as heavy as it can be, um, my... I would, I would prepare myself for encounters. It was easier because it would be when I'm visiting home to say, okay, I'm going to disarm the situation or this is what I've decided to do. I'm going to downplay the situation this time or I'm going to own it and I'm going to respond in humor. You know, instead of going to a heavy place, I'm going to go to a humorous place. That's like there's a chasm there that we're on – we're on different sides of, and some of it can't be, you, you're not going to ever be standing on the same side and like, oh, now this feels perfect. This feel, we both feel at peace, but you can find a way to move forward. It's like, hey, we've gotten through the worst conversation. 
You know, you found out, or I told you. And now, on the other side of it, um, I am happy, and so I'm going to represent that, which might be a little bit of humor and gentle ribbing. You know, gentle ribbing for your for your pleasure. <laughs> Um, the, I'm, you know, I'm not really presented as advice. This is what I, this is what I went, went through. That's kind of like and the that's, stages because of me. That, that's and that was over are. like 15 years. And that's who you are and that's who this particular family member is. And so, right. I, again, I think it goes back to, well, you know, it depends on your particular situation. Uh, yeah, sometimes it would be like, well, if they're like, I'm praying for your salvation. It's like, I'm praying for you to stop believing this bullshit. Like, you, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know, it could be, right. you could give it right back to them, or you could be like, I pre, most time it's just like, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And I know, but, I know how much you love me, and I feel that right now. And I want to let you know that I really am in the best place I've ever been. And maybe that's a result. And I, of, of you praying for me, but I will say that I'm in the best place that I've ever been and I'm grateful for it. And I'm, I'm very much open, you know, so things yeah. like that kind of disarm a little bit and it's not this knockout, drag out, knock down, drag out kind of thing, but it, I cut you off. No, well, there's a related question. Let's hear the related question here. The next voicemail. Hey, Rhett and Link, this is Cash. Um, I've been constructed around the same time that y'all were. I need some advice. I don't feel like I can tell my parents, especially my mom. I grew up very, you know, very Christian, very Republican. My parents know that, like, I'm lean more Democrat, but they don't know that I am no longer a Christian. I feel like I would break her heart, and she's about to be 70, and I don't want her last years on earth to be thinking, oh, my son is going to go to hell. Like, I do not want her to think that. So I don't feel like I can tell her. Do you have any advice for me? Thanks. Love y'all. This is a good question, and I'm sure that you are in the same boat with a lot of people. Um, and this is where I would say you got to be the judge of this in your particular situation. I don't think that there is any obligation to tell anyone. It's just, that's, the first thing, that. that's the first thing I'll say is I don't think that there's just like, you live your truth and you live it proud. It's like, okay, maybe that applies in some situations, but like, honestly, like, half of life is just damage control. <laughs> you know what I'm <laughs> right. saying? Let's get real about this, you know? Yeah. And if it's gonna just rock your parents' world, you know what? If you don't think, if you're like, I, my suspicion is they can't handle it, then you know what? Follow your heart on that. You, if you think you can get by, it's, yeah, is it going to be hard to navigate? Yes. And then it, you know what? You never know. It might come out. You might not be able to hide it in some way. They might listen to this podcast and recognize your voice. No, I'm just, we'll, we'll, we'll bleep out your name. Um, but, yeah, it might eke out like a gentle fart. I think this is a case. Overtime. I think this is a, definitely a case by case thing because I totally get it. The older people get, legitimately, from a scientific perspective, the less plastic their brain gets, and so the chances that, like, first of all, if you're in a, if you're on a crusade to change your elderly parents' mind about their faith, good for you, bro. But uh, that ain't what I'm trying to do. Uh, I'm not interested in that battle. And what I, what I always say is I was like, I just wanna, I want us to have a loving relationship. I want us to connect. I want us to connect over being, both wanting the best for each other, you know? And that doesn't mean we never talk about things, but the reason I told my parents, um, is because while I knew that it would be incredibly difficult, I believed that they would be able to, we would still be able to maintain a relationship and they would be able to handle it. And also my situation's a little bit abnormal in that. Yeah, when you're gonna- I knew at some point I would be talking on it, about it on the internet. And so like, you know, it was a little bit different, but I totally get it if you feel like you can't tell somebody and, I, and I'm not gonna hold it against you. Yeah. 
it's one of those things that like take it take it week to week, take it month to month, you know. It can some things it's like you know, it's it's better to slowly peel the band-aid back. You know, and maybe sometime, maybe one day you'll just find that the band aid's falling off, and you didn't even rip it. Yeah, and, but, I, and I will that, say that is that's one way. And I will say the other way is rip it off and then like let the scab form and like let's have a scab analogy. I don't know. And and now here's I want to say this again because a lot of times I understand we speak from a very particular perspective and we right. we, we we miss other people's situations. So if part of your deconstruction uh was is you like literally like um uh, you know you're like you're gay and your parents don't know you're gay mm -hmm. i feel like that's a di that's it's a i feel like that's a different thing i can't speak to that that's not my experience but i'm not going to tell you or if you're you the victim to, like, of some trauma stay in the closet because you don't want to upset your parents that's a completely different situation i'm talking about just the aspect of faith and sometimes those things might go hand in hand, and right. that might be a different path for you. Uh, but I'm just saying that, like, I just think you got to think about, you know, you got to think about your own well being, and you know, and you and you're actually also thinking about your your parents or your relatives' well being because you're mm -hmm. actually thinking about how their hearts gonna be broken. So nothing wrong with that. How many more of these do you want to hit? Um, well, I'm having a good time. And I and and we don't get to talk about this stuff a lot of times. So I, I I'd like to I'd like to finish the. F we've only got three more. I'm gonna talk about my dogs a little bit. No, I'm just kidding. No, go ahead. Three more. Um, <laughs> you you ready to stop? I'm no, I'm not. I'm I'm, I'm here for this. Okay. <laughs> Kaladinar forty two uh, said, "What made you decide between deconstructing versus renegotiating?" I think this is a good question because there's a lot of deconstruction that is happening um, culturally. Can you define I, Can you define what renegotiating would look like in this analogy? Well, I think that, the, the, you know, we deconverted, right? So first of all, deconstruction, as I've said many times, overused word. It was, you know, it was commandeered by the deconstruction community. It was, a you know, a term that Jacques Derrida came up with in the 60s to talk about the you know, talking about text and meaning, and it was a, a, a different thing. It was a textual criticism thing. But because it makes sense, because you're deconstructing your ideology, that's the word that is used. There's a, some, and the church is responding in a couple of different ways. One way that the church is responding is saying that you're deconstructing some good things, you know, you're deconstructing some some parts of this that are sort of the human construct of what we believe, but you you need like really it's a renegotiation of your faith and you want to still be in the house, in the Christian house at the end of this. Whereas if you just start on this deconstruction journey and you're just pulling the thread, pulling the thread, you're your own authority or whatever, you're the whole thing's just gonna fall apart and you're gonna be like Rhett and Link and you're gonna deconvert. So I think the subtext of this question is. Why'd you just completely tear it all down? Baby with the bathwater? Versus what? renegotiate your relationship with this whole thing. Keep the parts that really matter. And my simple answer is, I renegotiated for over a decade. That My deconstruction was a constant renegotiation, was a constant reorienting to a new place where I would have certain things that were left intact until I got to that place where I was holding on very tight to Jesus. And I was like, all I can hold, I don't know what I even think about the Bible, but I'm holding on to Jesus. I think he's bigger than all this. And I held on to him for a while. Uh, and then when I realized that the Jesus that I was holding on to was a conception, it was a, it was a human conception, not that Jesus doesn't, didn't exist, but I'm just saying our picture of Jesus, whatever that is, is by necessity a human conception and is related on some level to some historical Jesus and it's very difficult to determine what that was. And for me, that was a breaking point. So I'm just, so if somebody is like, well, I've, I don't believe this, but I've stopped here again, this, I don't prescribe the process to people. I would just say that I constantly renegotiated, but the final renegotiation, I negotiated my way out of it. <laughs> 
So I kind of think they're the same thing, ultimately. It has to all be on the table, right? I mean, to for it to be a legitimate exercise, though, it's like, well, you can you can look at evolution, but you can't, but you still got to believe this about the Bible. Well, you can believe this different thing about the Bible, but you got to believe this about the New Testament. You can believe this about New Testament, but when what Paul, when Paul says this, you got to believe it, and like you can believe you can forget all that, but you get when it comes down to Jesus, right? And it's, I mean. What are you afraid of? You, it it kind of all has to be on the table. But absolutely, I I agree. It was it was a it was a process down what we were told was a slippery slope until you're falling off the roof. I guess having that ex- exited the attic. But uh, I agree. I think it it was an iterative process. Well, I still got this. Well, now I don't have that, but I still got this. So I'm still on the inside, right? And I'm still not going to change my label, right? And yeah, it's like over decades. It's not like you listen to a couple of podcasts and then you decide that, yeah, I'm de- I'm I'm deconstructing. Yeah, I'm out. Right. Interesting question here from LTN's fridge. <laughs> Would any sort of worldly event have you reconsider the legitimacy of the Bible? For example, the many events written about in Revelations. Well, it's is it not rele- revelation? Yeah, it's revelation. Is it revelation? It's it's <laughs> it's revelation without an s. It is the most common. Let's not put an s on it. It is the most common mispronounced book of the Bible. I it's think one that, revelation, guys. If when people stop saying revelation, I can't, damn it, I can't even say it. It's not. Yeah, it's not revelations. It's when, revelations, <laughs> and it's revelation. This joke is very ironic with the way that I'm screwing yeah, it. Right. Up. Yeah. Yeah. Should I still make it? Go for it. I want to see where it lands. All right, let me try this. <laughs> When people stop saying revelations, that's when I'm back in. That's I, when if y'all if y'all can do that, if y'all can stop saying revelations, I'm back in. Especially like, listen I, completely. Especially if like I, I gotta say washed in the blood a whole nine yards. If you're a Christian and if you believe that the Bible is the word of God, you gotta get revelation right. You can't say revelations. When I get into conversations with people and they say revelations, I'm like, you don't really know, do you? It's just one, right? It's just one. It's just one. Now, here's the thing that I hate about saying this is that like there's some, well, actually, when you look at the exegesis of the grammaticron, you'll see that yeah, the- the old grammaticron. Pl- the concept of the plurality was seen different in the time of, uh, on the island of Patmos. Uh, <laughs> you know a thing or two about it, Link. Um, I think this is a revelation. Gr- this is a great question because it gives me the opportunity. Um, well, helicopters. To, to, to point, we got them. To point something out. Are you back in? Yeah, yeah. Helicopters. Yeah. Every generation of Christians has assumed that the Book of Revelation is about the time that they are living in. Right now, not, not all Christians. Not all Christians. But within every generation, there are many, many Christians who believe that it's about the time that they're living in, which says two things about, two things to me. First thing is people love being the main character, man. <laughs> people love being the main character. We can't help ourselves. It's got to be about us. That's, we, that we're living in it right now. That's the U.S. That's Russia. Ah, Antichrist, Trump, Obama. Helicopters. We, we just know it's about us. People find in the fucking vaccine in Revelation. Really? You know, so, oh yeah, Mark of the Beast. So, now, but the other thing it, it tells me is that- I'm glad we didn't end this podcast. Yeah, this now, is- this Now is, we're finally getting into this trouble. This is the part I love, man, <laughs> talking about this shit. Um, the other thing it tells me is that this is the nature of apocalyptic literature, which is, it's vague, bro. It's vague on purpose because it makes it real easy to make connections between a lot of different things uh, that are happening and the 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 these prophecies. And that I would just I would extend that people would be like, "What about all the prophecies?" I was like, "Have you really looked at all the prophecies? Do you know the nature of the prophecies? Do you know the nature of the way that the New Testament was?" Uh, written in light of some of the prophecies that were written back in, r- into the text by by Christians, like I've looked at it. I did not. I'm not compelled by it. Right. I'm not convinced by it. But um, 
The other thing is, is like, it's one of those situations where if you take a, what I would say is an honest and truthful approach to the text of Revelation, the first and most likely explanation of the text is that John, while he was on the Isle of Patmos, was writing about his time. He thought that the world was about to end in his time. The things that he was writing about were about the churches that he knew about, the, the people in the places that he knew about. Yes, he was writing with all this imagery, but he wasn't writing about the year 2000. He was writing about his time. Um, and apparently licking toads in the process. Well, we don't know exactly why, <laughs> but like this is this is not unheard of. This type of writing. Um, now, but all that. So anyway, I'm just saying that no, like no, I don't think that something's going to happen that can be tied back to this. However, if we end up with a Kirk Cameron left behind situation, and I'm on a plane, and all of a sudden a significant portion of the people vanish and it's just their clothes in their seats. If that happens, I'd be like, ah, oh, maybe I was wrong. Clo uh, that's what happened in the movie? Clothes yeah. in seats? Even though the idea of the rapture as it was portrayed in Left Behind is an invention of 1800s Christianity and is nowhere found in the Bible, that doesn't matter. If that happens, I'm still on board. I'm coming back! <laughs> okay. That's a higher bar than mine, but uh, I'll see you when you get there. Um... So yeah, I just think that you can make any connection you want to. That's kind of the point of it, right? Like you can make those connections if you want to make those connections. But if you've kind of lost the desire to make those connections, you just see it like you see any other religious writing. Kind of cool, but like not gonna, and it doesn't really apply to me, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, Jacob said, I've listened to all of the Deconstruction podcast. He made it singular. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> all of the Deconstruction podcast. Right. Well, it's kind of like Revelation. Our, you know, this yeah. podcast and all this series that we do is kind of like Revelation. Okay. Like, it's and all if, over the place. Okay. And Jacob has come to a conclusion and have come to a conclusion that influence has a lot to do with your belief. As a Christian, my question is what main thing pushed you over the edge to walk away? Also, why do you need so much evidence to believe something? This is a good question, Jacob. Um, so we've already talked a plenty about what pushes up, pushes us over the edge. I'm not going to get back into that. Uh, we've kind of told our story multiple times. Uh, I agree with you, as I explained last week, that I do believe that uh, influence has a lot to do with your belief. And when I say you are, I mean your belief <laughs> and our belief and everyone else's belief. I, we are a product of our environments. Mm -hmm. But the thing that's really interesting to me is this, why do you need so much evidence to believe something? This is a good question because a lot of people ask me, why do you think about this so much? Like what's the, what role does faith play in the equation for you? Because isn't like the point of this thing, in fact, Jesus, you know, in, in uh, the Gospels, Jesus comes to Thomas, famous for doubting. It's pretty cool. Um, and the disciples tell Thomas, they say, uh, you know, the Lord is risen. And he's like, well, I ain't going to believe it until I see it and I can place my hand in his side and see the holes in his hands. And then Jesus comes in through the wall, by the way, whew, through the wall. We're talking Copperfields kind of stuff. And maybe David Blaine. Okay. He comes into the room and then Thomas sees him and he believes. And then Jesus says, you know, you have seen because I proved it to you. Blessed are those who do not see, but yet believe. So it's interesting that that gospel ends with this sort of warning. Don't demand evidence. Believe, believe without seeing, right? Hebrews says, faith is evidence of, uh, of things not seen, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a this is quite a predicament, right? Because yes, if you like the resurrection, the resurrection is such an interesting thing because it's the linchpin of the whole Christian faith. Paul himself said that if Jesus is not risen, then we're fools. We are fools, right? And so a lot of Christian apologetics starts with trying to prove the resurrection. If you can get the resurrection established, everything else falls into place. But the interesting thing about the resurrection is I find all these debates about the resurrection, the historicity of the resurrection and the, you know, examining the evidences of the resurrection and whether or not 
uh, the resurrection is actually the best explanation for the start of Christianity. And people talk about this ad nauseum, and I listen to all of it. <laughs> um, I find it really interesting because I'm like, this is, you know, this is 2024. We have access to everything that's ever been written about this. I can go down into my gym and start working out and listen to these guys talk about this. But I am in the very, 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 very tiny, 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 small minority of people who've ever had access to this information the whole time the gospel has been in circulation, mm -hmm. right? So basically right after the purported event of Jesus' resurrection and whatever actually happened, up until literally like the 1900s, no one was like, give me the evidence for the resurrection. You just were told that Jesus rose from the dead and you had the opportunity to place faith in that idea, right? You can be like, what are the, what's the scholarly consistence, consensus on this? There are no scholars. You know, like half the people couldn't read. So I agree that faith must be the mechanism, if, if this is all true, faith is the mechanism by which it happens, right? It is a faith decision. It's not like a, I need to analyze the evidence. But interestingly, we don't live in that time anymore. We do live in a time where we can examine a bunch of different evidence. And so then the question becomes, well, what do I have faith in, right? So you remember the, the, those guys, the Mormons that came to our, uh, apartment. our dorm, our, our, yeah. our apartment. And um, interestingly, when I went on summer projects or something, and you ended up meeting with them multiple times, which I found very interesting. <laughs> but in the meantime, I had written this, I, I've still got a copy of it, and it's like a handy dandy guide to talking to your Mormon friends, right? <laughs> because from the evangelical standpoint, Mormonism is a false religion, right? Uh, they're not Christians, according to evangelicals, right? Because they believe in this other revelation. They believe in, you know, Joseph Smith and what happened with him in the 1800s and him seeing the, you know, writing the Book of Mormon and then Jesus coming over and being with the Native Americans and there's, 12, the 12, there's a, another tribe and all this stuff. These events that happened in relatively recent history. And sort of a Mormon might say, I have faith that those things happen. I have faith that Joseph Smith was a prophet. I have faith that the Book of Mormon is true and that this is the final and greatest revelation. And then the Christian would be like, well, how does the Christian challenge the faith of the Mormon? How does the evangelical Christian challenge the faith of the Mormon? They do it through forensics and they do they you know it, the cool the interesting thing about it is that the the events they demand that, evidence the events that happened to bring about the mormon church were very very recent and you can kind of look at them in a way that you can't look at the stuff that happened two thousand years ago it's a different type of it's a different time right it happened freaking america <laughs> you know and you know i read all at the time read all the apologetics about a, you know that kind of deconstructed mormon belief and that was my perspective as an evangelical and i was like well, you can say that you have faith in this. You can say that you have a burning in the bosom is what they would say. But my challenge to you is that I can show you that this isn't worth having faith in, right? And my and so that's how you would analyze another faith. And I think that if you turn that level of scrutiny onto the Christian faith, it's a different process. It's not as easy. <laughs> Uh, but I think that the result ends up being the same. So while I do think that in this, <clears throat> if you're on the inside and you believe and you have faith, that totally makes sense. And having faith is kind of the way to perpetuate the belief. But once you get on the outside, a question like, why do you need so much evidence to believe something seems nonsensical. Because I would be like, well, because how am I supposed to know what the truth is? How do you know what you're supposed to have faith in? Why are you not a Mormon? Why aren't, why aren't you, why do you not believe that Joseph, Joseph Smith said that he was a prophet of God. Why don't you believe him, Jacob? You know, not to call you out, but you asked the question. Do you have a reason why you don't believe that Joseph Smith is a prophet? And so why don't you just have faith? You see how you see where we're getting with that? And so I think the reason I need evidence to believe something is because I don't know of a better way to orient my life. Now, on top of that, or in addition to that, does that mean that I don't believe things, I only believe things that can be verified empirically? No, I believe 
as we talked about last year, that the creative process of, I believe in essentially what you might call the muses, right? I believe that creative ideas come from somewhere outside of us. And we, our job as creative professionals is to be the best possible antenna we can be and receive these ideas. Do I have evidence of that? Well, I've had some interesting things happen that seem like maybe that happened. Can I prove it to you? No. Do I expect you to believe it? No. Can I be, is it very, very possible that it's not true? Yes. Am I going to write a book about it and start like make you show up and believe it and tell you if you don't believe it, you're going to experience eternal conscious torment? No, maybe, I'm not. Maybe. <laughs> because I hold to it loosely. It's a different kind of belief. What I have faith in are the things that I want to be true, the things that seem cool to be true, but I don't have faith in um, things that can be investigated empirically. That's a different thing. I don't, again, people talk about evolution all the time and the criticism from I hear from many Christians is that, well, you have faith in these scientists who tell you about evolution. And that just, what that betrays is that you don't understand evolution and you haven't been educated about it. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just saying that anybody who says that is not familiar with the evidence. It's a different type of thing. It's not something you have faith in. It's something that there is astounding empirical evidence for that is on a completely different level than what we understand about the nature of the beginning of religions like Christianity. It's a different thing. And so there are still many Christians who have faith in Jesus and it's transformational, it's empowering. And I'm not saying you shouldn't, I love Jesus. And I don't know where I'm gonna end up in my faith journey, right? But I don't think about those things related to the resurrection and the way I think, and the way you decipher what's true about it in the same way that I investigate the claims of evolution. These are, these are, these are, this is a different type of knowledge. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's why I'm not a Mormon link. Yeah. But you were you were with the Mormons for a whole summer. And yeah. Did they, did they talk you into it? Nope. <laughs> well, there you have it. Another year of I'm sorry, I get, being spiritual. I get excited about it. And here's the thing. I don't. I don't want to talk about this. It's just like I don't want to talk about. Let's AI. talk about AI. I don't want to talk about AI. <laughs> but when you just give me a chance to start talking about it, I just want to talk about it and I want to get it out of my system. Did you? And then for you, not talk about it. Well, let, a lot. Listen, he, it's year. not out of his system. Go to Rhett's personal TikTok. I'm not going to submit if you, you to want it. to hear more. I'm of not going to submit you to it anymore for a while. It will be on Rhett's personal TikTok. No, I do here. That. I do that occasionally. Here we are uh, resuming um, regular scheduled program. Where we just talk about funny stuff. Yep. It doesn't matter. So come back next week. Use hashtag Ear Biscuits. Leave us a review. <sighs> and a voicemail. one 888 one Blessings. Hey guys, I just finished listening to your um, Rhett response to being in a book podcast. And I wanted to thank you, Rhett, for sharing. It really means a lot to me. I actually, um, I listened to it with my mom and she has always, you know, she raised me to be super religious and it kind of helped her understand the way I see things and that, you know, I'm not really a horrible person for not necessarily being a Christian. And um, I guess that's it. Thanks, guys. I don't know if y'all actually listen to these. 